So good morning, um, and thank you for joining us today uh, at this public lecture, Federalism and Healthcare, Lessons from Brazil, which is presented by Catarina uh, Segato, how, uh, Houston Family Postdoctoral Fellow at uh, the Johnson Triama Graduate School of Public Policy, uh, GSGS. Uh, GSGS is a provincial center for advanced study and research in public policy and administration. The school is the product of a partnership between the University of Regina and the University of Saskatchewan and was based on the spirit of cooperation and collaboration that defines Saskatchewan. Uh, at this time, I would like to acknowledge that today's event is taking place on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 land uh, and the traditional homeland of the Métis. My name is Daniel Bellin, and uh, I'm Canada Research Chair in Public Policy as at the school here at the UAS campus and I will be your moderator uh, today. As many of you know, we are one school with two campuses, so I would like to extend a warm welcome to our colleagues and guests at the University of Regina campus. And uh, of course, you can see them, beautiful people on the screen. <laughs> uh, and uh, the event uh, at the, um, the uh, U of R will be moderated by Bruno Duperon. Raise your hand, Bruno. Hello, okay, he's there, that's good. Uh, today the school is extremely pleased to, uh, to welcome Catarina uh, Segato, uh, who holds a PhD in public administration and um, government from the Sao Paulo School of Business Administration. Since the fall of 2016, she has been a Houston Family Postdoctoral Fellow at uh, JSGS and um, she's based at the uh, U of R uh, campus, but she comes to Saskatoon regularly. Uh, our generous donors, uh, Mary and Stuart Houston, are here today to attend this talk, and we'd like to thank them again for their generous support, without which this fellowship uh, will not exist in the first place. Katarina's research focuses on the relationship between federalism and public policy in healthcare and education, and its implications for social and regional inequalities. She has already published more than 15 academic papers in English and in Portuguese, which is her mother tongue. Today, Katarina's talk, once again, is titled Federalism and Healthcare, Lessons from Brazil. This talk will reflect some of the work she has conducted as a Houston Family Postdoctoral Fellow since she had joined uh, the school in the fall of 2016. But it's only the tip of the iceberg. It's only one aspect of her, her research agenda. So. Uh, after the talk, of course, we'll entertain questions at both campuses. And for now, please join me in welcoming Katarina. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to thank both uh, Mary and Stuart Houston for this opportunity. Also, I would like to thank uh, Daniel and Bruno for the support during these two years and all the learning opportunities and all the professors and staff members from uh, Johnson Shurama, uh, Doug from Un Johnson Shurama University of Regina. And I would like to thank everybody that is here uh, today uh, in a cold morning uh, to talk about healthcare in Brazil and uh, then a little about Canada. Uh, as Danielle said, I'm a postdoc uh, a fellow here. I started, uh, my project was uh, kind of a continuation of what I have been studying in my PhD, but in my PhD I study education policy. Uh, I study how states and municipalities, uh, how states had a cooperation um, programs with municipalities to decrease inequalities or to um, guarantee more consistency among municipal education policies uh, in Brazil. And then our discussion here is a little based in this, uh, in this uh, discussion of how we can uh, ensure and guarantee universality and more consistency in policies uh, in federal countries. Uh, we will uh, discuss a little more uh, in more details this theoretical discussion later, but this is kind of uh, the main um, discussion we are making here. Uh, just to, as Danielle said, I am going to present the findings of two papers, uh, and then I'm going to present uh, the findings of other two papers that uh, compare Brazil and Canada. Uh, so uh, we are, I'm bringing here different findings from different papers. 
And uh, I also conduct a research project. So besides uh, what I'm presenting here, that it's more focused on uh, the changes in healthcare systems and how federalism interacts uh, influences uh, these changes. Uh, I conduct a research project about uh, uh, refugees' access to health care. Uh, so, but the main discussion was still how federal government and provinces uh, cooperate uh, to decrease barriers in the health care system. Um, so then we can discuss uh, more about that later. Uh, but I just I would like to point that this is just like a, a, a part of the work I have been doing in the last two years. Um, so my presentation, I will present uh, some uh, context about the Brazilian case. And then I'm going to discuss a little the theoretical discussion, um, and then the research questions, the methodology, and finally the findings. Uh, and then I will um, just uh, summarize uh, with a two main. Uh, I I summarize uh, two main lessons uh, that we can. Um, think about the Canadian case based on the findings uh, we uh, discussed about Brazil. Okay, so Brazil uh, is a federal country uh, like Canada and that's why we are comparing both countries, uh, but they are very different, so I'm going to talk a little about that. Uh, Brazil uh, have 27 states and more than 5,000 municipalities. Um, States and municipalities are recognized by the Constitution as federal entities. And municipalities were not recognized. Uh, they were just recognized with the Constitution of 1988. But this is very unique because uh, there is no other federation uh, in which municipalities are federal entities. So this is a kind of a unique characteristic of Brazil. Uh, so at the same time that we have a huge decentralization of social policies, uh, especially after this constitution, we still have uh, centralized systems. So we will discuss this uh, later. Um, so this constitution uh, decentralized most social programs to state and municipalities, and also uh, gave powers, administrative, political, and financial autonomy uh, to state and municipalities. Uh, so they are able to, they have taxation powers, they can elect uh, a mayor and a council, they, uh, they have uh, responsibilities in uh, decision making uh, in social policies, uh, even though they need to follow national and state guidelines. Um, and what is uh, interesting about the Brazilian case is we are a symmetrical federation. This means that uh, all states and municipalities have the same powers and responsibilities. Uh, other federations uh, don't have this characteristic. So if we think about Germany, for example, we have some cities that have a greater population, that have different uh, powers and responsibilities, but in Brazil they all have the same. And we have a, a reality uh, in which we have, for example, Sao Paulo, with Sao Paulo is here, with more than 12 million residents, and we have few municipalities that have less than 1,000 residents. So we have a very uh, diverse uh, reality, and more, almost 70% of municipalities have less than 20,000 residents. Uh, so we have bigger cities, smaller cities, and they all need to provide the same services. Uh, so this is a huge challenge, not only to provide services uh, with, um, um, with similar outcomes, but also uh, we have a huge diversity in uh, financial capacities and institutional capacities among them. Uh, and as happens in other federations, some of the taxes that municipalities and states collect are related to socioeconomic development, so, uh, and we have a huge inequality, we have poor regions here and more developed regions here. So this uh, becomes a huge challenge of how can we provide um, a more consistent or universal uh, service in all country, across the country. Uh, regarding healthcare, 
uh, we, the Constitution also decentralized uh, healthcare uh, policies, uh, mainly service uh, provision to states and municipalities. Uh, and, but we still have uh, private hostels and service providers that were uh, that uh, few uh, th that uh, are also part of the system to provide the universalization of health care service as we will talk uh, in the next uh, slide. Um, and, but what is interesting about the Brazilian case is we had a situation uh, about health care. Uh, we had a situation uh, that uh, the health care was very centralized. Uh, other policies were decentralized in Brazil. So if we think about education, we had a decentralized path in which is, um, is states and municipalities provide the service, and then the constitution just consolidate this decentralization. But in but healthcare, it was centralized, so the Ministry of Health and other two agents, other federal agencies were responsible to establish the contracts with private providers and with states and municipalities. Uh, so what happens in the 80s, it's this, uh, we will talk, uh, this group of uh, uh, progressive uh, health professionals uh, started to influence the policy uh, and they want to decentralize uh, the policy uh, and they, so they started this process of, establi of establishing contracts with states and then states would be responsible to establish the contracts with private uh, providers and with municipalities. Uh, but then the constitution uh, consolidated this process, determining uh, competencies of each uh, federal entity in this policy and then uh, the federal government was only responsible to the guidelines and the regulation of the system, not to provide services anymore. Uh, we have uh, uh, this proposal of a, a hierarchical system. Uh, so municipalities are responsible for primary and preventive care. And then states, some municipalities that have hospitals are responsible for emergency. And then states are responsible for emergency and specialized care. And then the, the federal government is responsible for the regulation and guidelines of the system. Uh, another uh, in change that the constitution Determined, but the change was made in the 90s. Uh, it's the uh, elimination of three federal agencies and the uh, consolidation of uh, all responsibilities uh, in the federal government at the national level. So we don't have a fragmentation and lack of coordination anymore, and we have one uh, Ministry of Education uh, held responsible for uh, this policy. Um, Another thing that the constitution changed was to establish a universalization of health care. Uh, so that's uh, a second uh, feature that, that um, grounds our comparison. Both countries have universal, universalized uh, health care systems. The constitution uh, determined what is interesting is, different from Canada, we have a constitutionalized universalization, uh, but the constitution determined that health is a, a, a social right. So this, uh, especially during the implementation of this universalized healthcare system, this, uh, we have a few challenges related to that, because first, uh, healthcare access is not related to any status in the in country. So everybody has access um, to healthcare. And besides that, um, we, have, uh, we have a universalization of drugs, even though we never really do, to, uh, made this decision as uh, Canada is debating right now. Uh, we, uh, we have a few uh, uh, people uh, asking for drugs. And then when governments say we cannot provide these drugs or cannot pay, we don't have enough funds, they go to courts and then the courts uh, decide in favor of people based on this constitutional right to access health care. So we have a challenge because uh, some drugs are uh, expensive, uh, are very innovative and super expensive. So we have a debate in Brazil if this is, this is um, a huge challenge uh, for us to provide uh, health uh, for everybody. But this is something that, as we will see, it was one of the proposals of this progressive health professionals of to, to have this as an important uh, project to have a universe 
and effective universalization of healthcare. Uh, so, um, to study uh, the healthcare, uh, some of the changes of the healthcare system in Brazil and then later in Canada, uh, we rely on uh, a theoretical discussion about, as I said, how to provide and how to guarantee universalization in federal countries. Uh, so some authors say that uh, federal countries would um, imp uh, impose barriers to universalization uh, for uh, some uh, reasons. One is well, decentralization and more autonomy to supranational governments would, would uh, increase the diversity in supranational policies, uh, which, uh, of course, it's also the objective of the federalism. And also, you would have barriers to a national consensus building uh, in, at the national level. So it would be harder to have, for example, concerns around universalization of healthcare or even other policies, uh, or specific uh, policies um, related to, 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 uh, to topics, especially when there is not a consensus in the country around them. Uh, so, uh, but then uh, some literature has been uh, saying that no, uh, actually we can ensure more consistency and in federal countries this is possible. So we could have like uh, different coordination mechanisms like especially fiscal redistribution. Uh, here in Canada, Daniel is a specialist. Uh, so uh, we could have other ones like project grants and you will see that in Brazilian case this is and also national regulation. Uh, it's important to point that other uh, uh, scholars believe that horizontal uh, relations would be um, important if we don't have this national uh, regulation. Uh, so they say, for example, in the case of Canada, uh, in education policy, we don't have a uh, Ministry of Education, but even without a Ministry of Education, we would be able to provide more consistency because we have a diffusion and a cooperation among provinces. Uh, so it, this would provide more consistency and less diversity among supranational uh, provinces. Another um, debate that we uh, rely on to analyze uh, healthcare changes uh, is the discussion about allocation of authority. Uh, so uh, this discussion uh, has been uh, very uh, central in healthcare reforms. And the debate generally is uh, decentralized or recentralized. What are the outcomes of both choices? Uh, so more decentralized systems, we would have an increase in competition uh, based on Chipu's idea that if you uh, citizens would move to look for better service, but also we could have, uh, and this could uh, provide more efficiency and innovation in the system. And uh, another group of people think this would also increase accountability and social participation because governments would be closer to people. And this is very key to the Brazilian debate because this was uh, very central in the diffusion of idea related to the decentralization and the the positive outcomes of decentralization. Um, and then supporters of centralization uh, believe that centralization would be better because increased coordination and consistency. And we will talk a little about, in the case of regionalization here in Saskatchewan, uh, some of the arguments to eliminate uh, the health regions is based on that. Like we need, uh, we have a great diversity, so we would need uh, centralization to provide more consistency. So we can debate because uh, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's very uh, debatable. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, we want to understand, okay, uh, there is a, a lot of discussion about how uh, these choices can uh, influence outcomes in the healthcare system, but how these decisions are made, how these ideas, uh, how the consensus around these ideas are made, who are the actors that, that support these ideas. Uh, this is important to understand uh, because also we realize, analyzing the Brazilian case and now the Canadian case, that uh, even the, the ideas around decentralization and regionalization change over time. Uh, so uh, regionalization uh, was implemented, adopted here to improve coordination, and then after um, 
<laughs> 10, 20 years, uh, it become a barrier to coordination. So how this idea has changed and who is supporting each idea. So this was um, the, what we want to understand. Um, So here uh, I brought uh, the research questions of two papers um, that we wrote, one we published and the other one it's revising and resubmitting. So we also would be willing to, to have some contributions and uh, at the end I will talk about uh, the papers that compare Brazil and Canada and also uh, we are finishing to write about regionalization so also it would be very interesting to hear your contributions. Uh, so one of the papers we talk about uh, what factors influence policy changes uh, in the development of universal health care coverage in Brazil and we are discussing this idea of federalism being a barrier uh, but also we will see that our findings in federalism was actually uh, uh, provide different channels for health professionals to uh, promote changes within the system. Uh, and we also, to discuss that, we looked at the literature that talks about the importance of bureaucracy in healthcare changes, but also partisanship and also other factors that influence healthcare changes. And the second uh, question was uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, the system, as we will see, uh, decentralized uh, healthcare, but there is this very strong dependency of centralization. Uh, we have uh, uh, we create two councils and commissions, uh, and in which subnational governments have representation. So we would like to understand uh, how the decisions related to equalization payments, uh, but including intergovernmental transfers. Uh, were made and how subnational governments influenced that. How, uh, because we will see, they actually we had a recentralization path. So we want to understand if uh, there was any, uh, if subnational governments support a recentralization process, so they uh, accept losing autonomy or not. Uh, so uh, the methods, methods. Uh, we, I in the two questions, uh, I divide uh, the time period I analyze in two. Uh, one uh, in the healthcare changes, uh, the changes that happen just after the constitution. Uh, I use uh, mostly uh, the literature because there are studies already discussing that, and then the changes after the constitution to implement the decisions. Uh, I understand that the implementation of decisions change slightly or redesign some of the decisions, so it was important to uh, analyze this path, so these other changes. Um, and then we uh, used uh, documental analysis, literature, but also in deep interviews. And in deep interviews, uh, more focused to try to fill the gaps of the literature because we had lots of documents and uh, some lit descriptive literature just telling how was the process, a historical process. So the interviews were made to uh, understand better the dynamics. Uh, in the case that I will talk later about regionalization, we have been using a lot of interviews because it's a recent process, so we don't have a lot of documents. Uh, and uh, in the case of the, the changes in the intergovernmental transfers and equalization system, uh, we, uh, I, through the documental analysis, I map to uh, most important changes. And then the interviews and the analysis of documents were focused on these two changes. Well, so I'm going to present some of the findings and then I will finish with the lessons. Um, so uh, first, uh, the literature highlights the, the strong path dependency in the, the central, in the centralization path of the Brazilian health care. Uh, and this is important because uh, this is for two reasons. First, the Constitution allowed the federal government to have shared responsibilities in health care, and this was uh, intended uh, 
determining shared responsibilities of all uh, federal entities in this policy was intended to uh, decrease gaps in the service provision. So it was an intentional overlap, but at the same time allow federal government to uh, influence policies, uh, most policies, including healthcare. Uh, and another thing is they create two uh, national commissions, as I said, uh, the National Council of Health and Intermanagers Commission, uh, and both uh, are important bodies to, um, to decide about um, the policy and also to uh, fiscalize and, and approve some of the decisions. But uh, both uh, both uh, councils uh, have a very small uh, representation of subnational governments. Uh, so most uh, most uh, representatives are uh, from the federal government. Or this change over time, and now uh, they include uh, service providers and other players in the system. Uh, but in the beginning, it was mainly federal government and also some specialists. And one of the the things we find we find in the with the research is that uh, we had some health professionals that were able to influence policy through their participation in this in this council in the beginning, just after the approval of the constitution, so in the beginning of the first changes uh, uh, in the new, uh, to implement the universalization of healthcare and also other changes in the healthcare system. Um, well, uh, the constitution, um, uh, the, well, so during the constitutional uh, approval of the 1988 constitution, uh, we had a group of uh, people uh, that uh, we call sanitaristas. They believe a, that we should uh, provide universalization, uh, universal health care, but also that we should focus on pre preventive and primary care. Uh, and they believe that the only way to do uh, to universalize health care in Brazil was to decentralize. So that's why it's when Decentralized is combined to the idea of universalization because uh, they uh, we wouldn't be able to universalize healthcare with public uh, public um, just public equipment. So they would need to rely on private sector. But to decrease the importance of the private sector because they were against uh, the private the private sector in healthcare, uh, they they thought that decentralization would be uh, the way to universalize healthcare. So in increasing uh, service provision through state and municipal uh, service, uh, we would be able to provide universalization. Uh, so then there was an idea that universalization would um, increase innovation, social participation, but actually what was behind was the idea that it, it was through decentralization that we could universalize healthcare. And this uh, group of people, uh, they, they influenced not only the constitution, they were able to convince some politicians, they mobilized different actors during the approval of the constitution, uh, so they were ever, very, very influential, and they also, they were from universities, they were physicians, uh, they were uh, related to some research institutes in Brazil, uh, and but they also influenced some uh, later, like decisions that were made later uh, about the healthcare. And, um, and I would, and we could highlight their participation uh, in the HIV policy, uh, Brazil approved in the 90s, uh, IHIV policy treatment uh, for all, uh, and also uh, the, the drug production in Brazil, some uh, innovative regulation about uh, drug production. So they influenced not only uh, the decisions uh, related to universalization, but also other decisions that were considered innovative uh, in the healthcare in Brazil. Um, at the same time, uh, they were able to, especially we had some governments that they didn't have a lot of uh, uh, 
let's say they didn't have the, the uh, alignment in uh, in the uh, ideological um, ideas, so they didn't have a lot of space within the federal bureaucracy. Uh, so during this moment, they act more actively uh, in the subnational government, uh, so influencing the, the development and adoption of innovative policies at the subnational level. So what we, we realize is just federalism was uh, actually uh, gave cha different channels so they could influence the policy in different ways and not even pro uh, promoting these innovative uh, chains at the subnational level, but also being representatives of subnational governments at the national level in these commissions and, and councils. Uh, so they were able to, so federalism gave different channels for them to influence policy. Uh, related to the inter-managers, inter, uh, uh, intergovernmental transfers, uh, they, we, uh, they were not, they, they, they support the idea that uh, more resource for healthcare was important to ensure minimum spending. So they support a recentralization uh, or the, uh, the decrease of uh, discretionary uh, of subnational governments in decisions about spending. Uh, and because of this, the restricted role of subnational governments in these uh, commissions and councils, uh, we had decisions that decrease uh, subnational uh, governments' autonomy and increase uh, some of uh, and increase some uh, regulations regarding spending. So we had two important um, changes that happened uh, after the constitution. One was uh, the um, the, uh, one is, is related to a project grant uh, that uh, the federal government provides resource to state and municipalities that uh, implement a specific federal program that we call a uh, family health strategy. Uh, it's uh, to basically to restrain primary and preventive care in municipalities, uh, but they need to implement the federal program. So it's a, a kind of recentralization. Uh, and uh, the second change was the establishment of a minimum spending for states and municipalities. So states are, um, uh, are obliged to spend 13% and municipalities 15% of their um, uh, budget with healthcare. Uh, so then this was a national consensus and a consensus that was supported by these progressive uh, health professionals. But uh, in some way, it, it's, uh, it, it recentralized. So we have a shift in the, this idea of decentralization as uh, a good thing to uh, universalization of healthcare for them to, uh, in case of other changes, uh, we had a, a different uh, view that maybe recentralized the system would be better to provide more consistency and ensure same spending across the country. Uh, I also, it's important to notice that the private uh, service providers, they are very fragmented in Brazil, especially during the approval of the constitution. So they were not organized enough to um, oppose. So that's why these progressive health professionals were able to uh, promote changes and to convince other actors about their agenda. And in the case um, of, but even, even, uh, even, Though they were not organized, they were able uh, to barrier a, a, a system that was um, uh, to totally public. So they were able to uh, include in the constitution the, uh, the participation of private service, so a two-tire system. Uh, so we don't have we have a, a public service that coexists with a private service, and. As I said, in some cases, the public contracts with the private to provide public service. Uh, this health progressive professionals, they uh, progressive health professionals, they uh, have been losing uh, power in 
uh, and importance because they are not so organized around the idea of universalization and private and primary care. Uh, and also other private service providers uh, increased their powers in the last years, so they have been uh, more active uh, promoting changes than uh, progressive health professionals. Uh, regarding the change of the equalization, as I said, uh, we had a recentralization and also a, a decrease in the autonomy of subnational governments, uh, their decisions on spending, and both changes uh, result in a recentralization process uh, that was re they reinforced the federal government's powers. Uh, so then I'm going to talk a little about uh, lessons to Canada, uh, how we can discuss the Canadian case based on this uh, um, analysis of the Brazil, and then I think we can discuss a little. Uh, I divide uh, this discussion in two parts. So. Uh, a discussion based on the allocation of authority and mainly uh, discussing regionalization uh, and the second uh, of, based on the role of physicians uh, and how the role of physicians influence changes in the healthcare system but also um, other challenges uh, to improve uh, improvements in the system. Uh, so related to allocation of authority, uh, the understanding of uh, the Brazilian case uh, help uh, us to think about how uh, regionalization also, uh, in the case of regionalization in the provinces, how regionalization change over time. And then, so we are finishing, uh, I'm finishing interviews and we are finishing, going to finish to write a paper, uh, discussing how regionalization was a concept related to a centralization uh, in the beginning of the process, a centralization from uh, hospital boards to the uh, health authority, but also a decentralization of powers from provincial governments to health authorities. So it was a uh, both process. Um, talking about allocation of authority, generally uh, regionalization is more attached to decentralization uh, in other countries. Uh, so generally this, the discussion of regionalization is uh, in, within the discussion of decentralization. But in Canada we have a different uh, model and we have a great variance uh, among provinces. So we thought it would be interesting to to discuss how this change, how this idea changed over time, and also uh, what regionalization means here. Actually, what, what when we talk about regionalization, what we are talking about. So to discuss outcomes, we need to know exactly uh, what this process um, um, meant here. Uh, in, and we thought Saskatchewan. Uh, we justify the Saskatchewan case because it's one of the provinces that just eliminate. Uh, so uh, moved to a recentralization model now, just recently. Uh, so then we want to understand how this idea changed and how uh, then we can understand the outcomes of the system and, improve and discuss improvements in the system based on the change of this idea. And uh, the last, uh, and this other uh, discussion is based on the role of physicians. So. In Brazil case, uh, physicians were able to influence uh, and promote innovative changes, and this is uh, this has been shown by other studies uh, from other countries. Uh, so they show this group of health prog the progressive health physicians influence uh, innovative changes. Uh, but why? Uh, how this happened, uh, which means uh, are characteristics in the system that influence the role of physicians. Uh, they have, so here in Canada, we have a different uh, model, uh, a model in which physicians uh, influence changes in the beginning, but now they are not, uh, they are uh, insiders and outsiders in the system, so this uh, has an impact in the uh, changes in the healthcare system and also in the discussion of healthcare in Canada. And even related to uh, the regionalization discussion, uh, 
the inclusion of physicians has, has been one of the goals of regionalization. So how can we include more physicians here in the Canadian model uh, to uh, first uh, have improved service, but also to ensure uh, the centralization uh, a goal of more consistency across the province, for example. Uh, so how uh, the different roles of physician influence uh, not only changes, but also uh, the outcomes of the system. Uh, I think that's it, and I would love to uh, talk about, answer a few questions, and also collect some contributions. Thank you.